I'm delighted to welcome back to the Foreign Policy Association, Dr. Margaret Hamburg. Peggy, it's good to see you. Welcome. Thank you, you last spoke to us in 2009 as the newly minted 21st FDA Commissioner. You're currently chair of the board of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I can't think of a more critical perch. The, the times uh, cry for replacing the valor of ignorance with the valor of knowledge, of science. Uh, a short while after you spoke to us, we were honored to also hear from Dr. Anthony Fauci, who delivered the inaugural uh, Dame Gillian Sackler Lecture on Global Health Issues. We've been advocating at the Foreign Policy Association now for some time for reconceptualizing global health as a foreign policy priority and as a vital national security interest. Peggy, what role should the United States play in promoting a coordinated international response that prevents COVID from returning to our shores once it's been suppressed? Uh, specifically, what can we do to strengthen the World Health Organization so that it can more effectively address this pandemic as well as future public health crises? Well, it's such an important question. Uh, and, you know, I applaud uh, the organization for really putting into focus the important linkages of health, global health, and foreign affairs, and the, the intersection of health and security as well. We have to work together as an international community now to actually stop the spread of COVID. Um, and then we have to recommit to working um, as an international community in order to be better prepared to prevent future pandemics and to address a wide range of significant health issues that, that we live with day to day, but also uh, ones that loom in the future. So I think that this COVID crisis has been a wake up call in many ways for those outside of the, the global public health community. We need to make sure that people don't hit the snooze button and go back to sleep, but we need to learn the lessons and integrate the lessons. You know, as we think about COVID-19 today and how this country, the United States, can move on to a, a new normal um, with the availability of vaccines and by pursuing assiduously the public health measures that can help to prevent transmission and bring the numbers down, the masking, social distancing, avoiding large um, gatherings, especially indoors, all of those measures. Um, we need to recognize that even if we do a terrific job in this country, our job won't be done even if we're thinking about in the most selfish ways about what's in the vested interest of the United States and all our citizens, if we don't care about what's happening elsewhere in the world, because the virus can continue to circulate, it can continue to mutate. And so um, virus anywhere can represent a recurrent or resurgent concern to us here in the US. So we really are all in this together. And the only meaningful and enduring solutions to the problem we have today and the problems of the future are to think about it in an integrated and global way. Do you think, Peggy, that there's any merit to a regional approach, uh, say a North American approach? Uh, we had Jorge Castaneda, the former Mexican foreign minister speak to us last week. And he was uh, telling us that the number of shots that uh, uh, our neighbors to the South are receiving are really, uh, it, it's, it's very, a very limited rollout program. And we're hearing the same is true in Canada, uh, that two and a half percent of, of the Canadian uh, population have been inoculated. Would it make any sense given 
the extraordinary interaction that we have with our neighbors in Mexico and Canada to have a, 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 a North American uh, uh, approach to, to this crisis? Well, I think regional strategies can make a difference. I think we need to go beyond just the region all the way around the globe because of how um, people and goods travel and how um, microbes uh, can travel as well. But I, I do think we need to be very mindful about how we work together. And, and that can happen on many different levels. You know, the Canadian situation is surprising because they've actually, as I understand it, um, uh, been able to at least contract for a very large number of vaccines, but they do seem to be having problems with delivering them. We, of course, are experiencing that in our country as well. It's not easy, um, but we also definitely are constrained by supply, and probably the Canadians don't have all the supply that they have contracted for available yet, um, but I don't know the specifics. Mexico may be different in that they may not actually have even the access um, contractually to vaccines that they need for their populations on the same level that we have. And we know that there are many, many countries around the world that don't have access to vaccines and haven't begun the process of vaccinating their populations. The majority of the vaccine that's available in the world today uh, is going to a very, a uh, small number of wealthier uh, countries. And we need to really rethink that situation and I think reset our priorities a bit because of this notion that no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, but there are other ways to work together as well. And one of the things as a former FDA commissioner that has been encouraging to me in the response to COVID is how the the scientific research community came together um, across borders to, to really advance the underlying science and enable us to do this extraordinary thing of producing a vaccine in less than a year. That had never been done before. Most vaccines take a decade or more uh, historically to um, uh, develop and put into use the fastest before the COVID vaccine was four years and that was for months. So that was an extraordinary coming together um, on an international basis to, to serve the global community. Another um, aspect of this was that regulatory authorities from around the world, you know, work together in ways that they haven't always to try to harmonize standards and approaches and uh, decrease workload uh, for companies that are dealing with multiple regulatory authorities as they try to move their products out for use. And that was something that when I was at the FDA, I worked on because I really felt in the modern world, we needed um, a, a more explicit global governance strategy for regulatory authorities to work together. And that sort of came into its own during, during COVID. Uh, turning to the uh, U.S. pandemic response, it's been said that trust is the currency of public health. How do we depoliticize uh, the response to this and future public health crises? Yes. Well, you know, trust is the foundation, trust and integrity for public health. I would say it's also probably the foundation for democracy. Um, and uh, in recent weeks, months, you know, we've been struggling with how to restore trust in both of those critical domains um, for our country and for other countries as well. But, you know, having led several important public health agencies, the New York City Department of Health, which is, I think, the largest health department in the country, at least it was when I was there, um, and the Food and Drug Administration, you know, I really understand how important trust is and that you have to really earn it every day. You have to demonstrate trustworthiness. It isn't something that just comes, you know, with the job or with the title. And sadly, we've seen some of our really critical public health institutions in this country damaged by the intrusion of politics and ideology 
into the decision making, both the Centers for Disease Control and the FDA, I think, have suffered badly during COVID. And it's been a tragedy for all of us because it has certainly undermined trust and confidence, which has many, many um, knock on um, effects, including as we look at the ability to, to vaccinate our population against COVID-19. We know that there is what we call vaccine hesitancy, but many people and sectors of the population that don't trust the vaccine and don't trust um, the agency and the industry um, that have, have, have made it possible to get the vaccine out for use. Um, and at the CDC, their critical role in providing guidance and information for business, for schools, uh, for the public in terms of what kinds of behaviors are safe, um, you know, from wearing masks to, um, you know, not um, uh, uh, being certain about the modes of spread and, you know, whether it's, it's safe to bring groceries in from the outside without spraying them with Clorox and other such things. CDC plays such a critical role in making information for, for people uh, to use available, but because of intrusions of politics, uh, they weren't able to produce important guidance in certain areas and people didn't trust the guidance as much. And, and really significantly at, at FDA, CDC and elsewhere, the, the depth and breadth of expertise that resides within those agencies wasn't fully harnessed because of the sort of politics that were driving um, so much of the decision making. And just one last thought on that, you know, the countries that did the best in responding to uh, COVID-19, when you look back and sort of dissect um, how things unfolded, leadership was key, speed of response was key, um, galvanizing public health measures early um, and effectively was also key. But essential was listening to experts and aligning policy making with available evidence and data. Peggy, our members have many questions about vaccine efficacy. Uh, perhaps I could start by asking you, how does emergency use authorization differ from uh, routine uh, FDA authorization? Well, emergency use authorization was uh, authority given to the FDA now, you know, a number of years ago, recognizing that there were circumstances, public health emergencies that required a, a swifter availability of certain kinds of medical products based on science and evidence, but um, where you look at the available data and make an assessment of risk and benefit and make it available earlier with less administrative overlay as well, but in a targeted way uh, with often ongoing study and you know, perhaps limited to certain uh, subpopulations as needed or indicated. So it's a tool to provide more flexibility in a crisis, but it's not a tool that says that anything anybody wants to do um, or have um, can be made available under this authority. It, it really is a way of, of trying to still guide medical product availability based on, on evidence, but recognizing that in a crisis, you, you may not have everything you want to know um, at a given moment in time. And when it came to the vaccine, in part because of the recognition that there were concerns about vaccine and a whole anti-vaccination movement that had been very active for many, many years preceding the COVID pandemic, and then additional concerns because of both the political environment and the speed at which the vaccines were being developed. A decision was really made 
to be very rigorous in the standards. Um, so in terms of the science, it, it wasn't that different than what would be required for a full authorization, except that with a normal vaccine approval, you would have more data over time. And that data is being collected now. These, these vaccines have not been in this country actually approved, but they're out and available through the emergency use authorization, but they will move towards a full approval that has you know, more paperwork, more I's to dot, T's to cross, and a, you know, there will be a somewhat fuller understanding of um, the vaccines in their, and their appropriate use. And, and, and that brings me to the question, what do you say to people who are vaccine hesitant because the long-term uh, effects of the vaccines uh, are unknown? Yes. Well, vaccines, you know, are always taken very, very seriously in terms of assessing safety and efficacy. All medical products, of course, that's the case. But with a vaccine, you're giving something to people who are healthy to prevent them from getting sick. So the sort of obligation to really understand them and their and their use is even higher. So these vaccines, while they moved very, very quickly and the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that, that are out there um, and people are being vaccinated with um, today uh, are a novel class of vaccine in terms of, of their use. They have been quite thoroughly studied. Um, the numbers of people who've been in these vaccine trials has been as large or larger than standard vaccine uh, studies. And the process of vaccine development didn't just come out of nowhere. There was work going on, investments in, in science at the basic level and the clinical level um, that was related, other coronaviruses or um, other infectious diseases that enabled some leapfrogging in terms of the speed of development. And then because vaccine development normally is, is expensive and risky for a company, uh, they, they like to go in a sort of stepwise way with a pause between each phase to really assess and um, make decisions about going forward. That was all compressed. Uh, so it went much more quickly and then uh, you may have heard the term manufacturing at risk. Decisions were made with government and industry working together to invest very large sums of money to start manufacturing some of these candidate vaccines before we even knew which ones would get over the finish line. Um, and some people have taken manufacturing at risk to mean that the vaccines are risky, but it really is a financial risk that you might um, be making a lot of vaccine that turned out not to be good. But when you look at the numbers and the data has been reviewed by outside independent scientists and experts. And I think that's very important for people to understand as the studies were going on, there's something called the Data Science Monitoring Board, which looks at data at intervals to see if there either are uh, concerns that it's not effective or you know, clear, um, indications that, that it's effective and maybe the studies should be stopped um, uh, so that people can actually start to get it more broadly. So that had been going on. And then before the actual emergency use authorizations were given, there was a public meeting with the data all made um, available on the web and discussed in public with a panel of, of outside experts um, the FDA scientists, the company scientists, and an opportunity for uh, members of the public to ask questions as well. So I think people should feel very confident. The data is strong. The level of efficacy far exceeds what anyone expected and is higher than most um, currently used vaccines. And so far, the safety profile 
is, is, you know, really quite extraordinary. A lot of what we call reactogenicity, where at the site of injection, you get, you know, soreness and, and um, you might get a little bit of low grade fever or um, uh, fatigue. Uh, I've only had one dose of a vaccine. I get my second dose next week. I'm told the second dose is sometimes a little more challenging in terms of of the effect. But you know, the good news is that that shows that your body is reacting. The vaccine is having um, its effect. And um, besides that, the safety profiles are strong. But there's continuing monitoring. Um, we call it pharmacovigilance, but it basically means continuing. Uh, to look for any emerging safety concerns and to continue to study the vaccine to know more about how it's working in the real world under less controlled um, conditions than with clinical studies. And importantly with these vaccines, because of the accelerated timeline for development, we need to learn more about how long does the protection of the vaccines actually last. And that brings me to a cluster uh, of questions on uh, the coronavirus variants. Um, is a faster vaccine rollout the most effective way to curtail new variants? Uh, and given that these uh, that the coronavirus is mutating all the time, uh, what should we know uh, about the coronavirus? Uh, variants that have already been discovered in the US? Well, there are a couple components to your question that I think are important to underscore. You know, we know that there are some variants that pose concern. The, the UK variant, the 117, which um, is more transmissible uh, and also sadly appears to be more lethal. Uh, is, has become quite, we don't know exactly where it originated. It was first noted in the UK, but you know, it could have come from anywhere, but you know, it moved quickly to become the predominant strain there. We've seen it um, spread to other places in Europe and we are seeing more and more of it in the US. And then there's the, the one that's associated with South Africa and um, Brazil, where we can actually see that, that aspects of, of those variants enable the virus to elude the immune response to some degree, both um, protection if you've had natural infection to infection with an, an earlier uh, version of the virus or the vaccines. Now, not completely um, vaccine and, and um, natural um, immune response uh, does provide some very meaningful protection, but we need to monitor it and we need to take these variants seriously. So that tells us a couple of things. One is we need to do everything we can to stop the spread of these variants. And that means doubling down on those public health measures, the non-pharmaceutical interventions of masking, social distancing, hand washing, and avoiding you know, large gatherings and trying to have appropriate ventilation when you can with indoor settings where um, there's you know, some gathering or density of people. <clears throat> we also need to get the vaccination out there as fast as we can, um, because that will also help uh, to limit uh, spread. And we need to keep our, our scientists busy with um, uh, both tracking the variants and, and as a nation, we need to dramatically up our genomic surveillance, meaning our tracking of these variants. Right now we're, we're actually doing that genomic analysis on less than 1% of our um, of our cases and you know we have the capacity as a nation to do much much better than that and we won't know what the risk contours are if we don't do that and then there's also the importance of continuing to think about new vaccines if variants um, continue to emerge and we need to be monitoring the impact of the vaccines on 
our existing vaccine portfolio. And the good news is that um, the some of the vaccine strategies that are underway, uh, including the mRNA vaccines, can be rapidly retailored uh, against um, new strains of virus. When it's reported that a vaccine is 95% effective, what does this mean in, 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 in practice? Does the vaccine prevent you from becoming infected or does it mitigate symptoms once you're effect, uh, infected? Well, two different questions there. Um, you know, the 95% doesn't mean that, that you know, 5% of people uh, that get vaccine automatically become infected, um, but it means you know, the, the, the probability of, um, of infection uh, and, and disease from the vaccine, I mean, from the, the virus um, uh, is, uh, you know, dramatically reduced by a vaccine that has 95% or 90% uh, efficacy. Uh, the way the studies were structured, it didn't actually give us all the information that we you know, might want to know. So there's ongoing studies. We, the, the studies looked at uh, the prevention of symptoms, sickness, and of course, hospitalization and death. And the vaccines are, are very um, effective at reducing um, uh, those characteristics. It, doesn't mean that the vaccines prevent you um, necessarily from getting infected. And that's important because you, we know with this coronavirus that you can have asymptomatic infection and you can still spread. And that's why people are being you know, told that they should continue to wear masks and social distance um, even after vaccination. And, um, that reflects the importance of, of understanding whether you can still be infected but asymptomatically and shed virus and potentially infect others. The, the data so far coming in from the experience in, in some other places, particularly Israel, and also some studies that have been done, um, you know, looking at this question here, it's very encouraging that, that the vaccination reduces the viral load and reduces the probability of spread. I mean, ultimately these vaccines are gonna make a huge difference for controlling uh, coronavirus, you know, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, just as vaccines have made a huge difference for public health against a range of diseases that, you know, almost don't exist in many places, but used to take huge numbers of lives. And, and uh, uh, follow up, how, how long does the vaccine provide protection? And will this time period differ depending on the vaccine? Well, we don't know the answer to that question. And I think I mentioned earlier that that's one of the important areas of ongoing study. Clearly the vaccines, you know, there are a range of different vaccine categories, as you know, um, uh, but the different types of vaccines um, uh, may produce immune responses of differing durations, but all seem to, you know, create a robust immune response. But we just don't know how long it will last. We may need to have an annual um, uh, COVID vaccine, like we have an annual flu vaccine. Maybe they could even do them together. There is a, a dual vaccine being developed, um, but it may be that it lasts much longer. There are certain vaccines, um, including for you know routine preventable diseases of childhood, where you you get a booster at a certain point. Um, uh, so it you know we're going to be learning more. We will not. Um, uh, be able to just close the door on COVID-19 and this SARS coronavirus too um, for a very long time, if ever. You know, it will likely be endemic. It may circulate with 
um, variants that will require different vaccination strategies. We just don't know, we can't be complacent, but the good news is that we have experienced this pandemic at a time when uh, science has never been stronger and we've been able to harness that science already in some remarkable ways and we, we can and will do an even better job going forward, I think. Uh, may I ask you uh, which vaccine you took? Because they're asking here, should people hold out for one vaccine over the other? You should definitely get whatever vaccine is available when it's available. I got the Moderna vaccine, which um, I was expecting I would receive based on where I was getting vaccinated. I live in Washington, DC and my vaccine appointment, which I got you know, by going on, online and frantically <laughs> searching um, was in a giant grocery store pharmacy. And uh, the Pfizer vaccine requires somewhat more specialized um, supply chain uh, freezer um, uh, uh, circumstances. And so the Moderna is a little bit easier for places that don't have deep freezes to provide. So I got the Moderna vaccine very soon, probably by the end of the month, I think the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which is a different type of vaccine will probably be available. That's easier to administer both in terms of the supply chain and storage conditions, but also it's a one dose uh, vaccine. Um, and so I think when that becomes available, that will change the landscape also. But, you know, you hear differing uh, numbers in terms of efficacy. And of course, we'd all like to have the one that works the best and for the longest. But I think right now, the critical thing is to get vaccinated. And uh, how do you appraise the Biden administration's uh, vaccine rollouts uh, thus far? Well, I think it's been going, you know, very well. It's not an easy uh, undertaking uh, under any circumstances. I think they inherited a more chaotic program than we would have hoped for. There had not been adequate transparency all along in terms of what was going on and what the plans were. Um, there was a lot of fragmentation with states just, you know, being told to to sort of go it alone. Um, and I think that further complicated things. And then the transition was messy for a number of uh, reasons of politics. Um, uh, and that of course had a impact on the ability to really assure uh, the smooth handoff of this critical distribution program. But I think the Biden team has been able to really work from a clear plan, engage the states, um, begin to provide more reliable and consistent information about what states can, could expect in terms of numbers, um, has been able to negotiate for uh, more vaccine in terms of volume and help support some scale up of manufacturing. Uh, and is now beginning to bring on additional vaccination centers, which is very important using pharmacies. And I hope soon we'll really start to engage the network of, of health clinics and, and um, uh, physician practices, uh, because that's an important and you know, well-practiced mechanism for providing vaccines to people old and young. Maybe I could... Uh ask a hopeful question uh, to conclude this session. Um, what will it take to achieve herd immunity and when do you think uh, that will be achieved? Well, you know, I actually think herd immunity is a term that's tossed around that, that isn't actually all that helpful. You know, the notion is you get to a certain number of people who have immune protection either because of infection um, that's naturally occurring or because of vaccination. And then there really isn't enough of a population for the vaccine to continue to spread and, and amplify. Um, but, and, you know, people say the numbers, you know, upwards of 60, you know, more like 70, 75%. But I think the critical thing is to just 
not be thinking about that as the end point, but about getting as many people vaccinated as we can and doing the things we need to do to limit ongoing spread. And I think if we focus on, on those two achievable goals, we can turn the tide on this COVID pandemic. On that note, uh, I wanna thank you very much, Peggy, for taking the time to uh, join us today and uh, for answering our questions uh, so thoroughly. Uh, I hope that uh, we will have a chance to have you grace our forum uh, uh, again in the near future. Thank you very much and take care and be well. <laughs>